very uh, busy time of the semester for everybody. So thank you again. Um, okay, so starting off presentation, let's just jump right in. Um, title, Perfect Barrier and Analysis of Residential Segregation in the Harrisburg Area. Um, and just, want to, just to start off, I want to give you some context into um, what my research kind of involves. Um, so here, this is a demographic map of the Harrisburg area. Um, and I have it showing the percentages of African American population by, um, I think, like the colors are divided up by census tract. Um, so you can see that, oh, I'm sorry, the darker, um, the darker colors are the higher percentages of African Americans and the lighter colors are the lower ones. So you can see that the, the river creates a very, um, a very clear divide between the dark and the light colors. Um, and so here are just some statistics um, from the projections from the, the census t uh, of 2010. Um, so you can see black population, Harrisburg, Stilton, and Progress, they're all on the east shore. Um, and so they have higher black populations, lower white populations. Transitioning to the west shore, um, very low black populations and pretty high white populations. And so just to compare that to the national and state averages, um, both sides are always either over or underrepresented in each of those towns. Um, so yeah, those are, and when I came across that information, um, I wasn't really surprised after living here for three years, and so I'm guessing that you probably aren't too surprised by that either. Um, so the question that I had going into this, this thesis that I was writing is, uh, why? And so that's what I hope to kind of, I hope to kind of give a couple reasons as to why that is. So I started looking at Harrisburg's history, and I went all the way back to the abolition of slavery. Um, so Pennsylvania passed an act for gradual abolition of slavery, and it was really gradual. So um, there were slaves until about 1840 in Harrisburg. Um, and during this time, it was actually Harrisburg was actually pretty integrated because if uh, the black population is living in the households of the white population, obviously that's very integrated. It's not the relationship we want, but um, there wasn't really a lot of segregation. Um, and so, uh, and so after 1810, when they weren't living in the white households anymore, they kind of followed the southern model of res residential uh, situation, and they blacks lived in like alleyways um, behind white households. So it was pretty integrated in that respect too. So that changed with the incoming of industry to Harrisburg, um, and so it brought a change in the residential housing patterns. Now we started to get. Um, Hot pockets, uh, small ghettos of black uh, um, black Harrisburg residents throughout the city. Um, but because this industrial revolution was pretty it was pretty slow, it wasn't as rapid as other cities like Detroit or Pittsburgh. Um, there wasn't one huge ghetto that was just relegated to the black community. It was a bit more integrated, um, even though there was an element of segregation in there. Um, and so, also something that happened that was really important to all of this during the Industrial Revolution of Harrisburg um, was that the economic subservience of the black community was cemented. Um, so this time was a lot of the time when a lot of whites became very uh, prosperous and they were able to economically benefit from the coming of industry to Harrisburg. Um, but blacks unfortunately didn't get the same opportunity. Um, they stayed with um, low wage menial labor jobs. And so that was kind of an opportunity that was missed um, to promote equality among the races in Harrisburg. Um, and so the response by the African American community to this was uh, that of accommodation. And so taking from like Booker T. Washington is philosophy, um, and basically that is that you're not going to resist um, the, the status quo, resist the the oppressive class. Um, you're going to just going to accommodate to it and. If you're by continuing with the work that they give you, we're one day going to rise up in the economic ladder. Um, so that is really important to the race relation, race relations in Harrisburg. Um, it was pretty peaceful, but there was indeed tension there. And uh, an important distinguishing factor between blacks and other minorities in Harrisburg is that they weren't able to overcome the color barrier. Um, so as a German immigrants and um, Italian or Irish immigrants um, kind of were able to assimilate into the mainstream culture and as their like old cultural distinctions faded away over time um, they were able to become the same social status as whites um, but blacks weren't because of this process of othering where, where we um, pick a physical distinction of another person 
and use it as a distinction and you're never, never really able to overcome that. Um, and so another opportunity that was really passed up um, in Harrisburg to help the black community was when the Eighth War was uh, was destructed um, or destroyed. Um, so the Harrisburg Plan uh, involved modernization and like beautification of the city in, in the early 1900s, and so it included the expansion of the new Capitol building into the Eighth Ward, and so that was a really lively and cultural, um, culturally rich area, but it was also very impoverished because, of course, blacks and, and immigrants um, were all living in poverty during this time, and so what the government ended up doing was they purchased 541 buildings and over 21 blocks um, by the year of 1917, and they um, destroyed it all, and they ended up extending the capital. Um, and so this was a win-win for them because they thought, okay, like we could get rid of this, this dilapidated part and we could also extend the capital to make it more beautiful. Um, but it was kind of just the more expedient route. They could have invested in the community um, and used that as an opportunity to um, help the black community in Harrisburg. Um, so yeah, that was another opportunity that they missed. But that's not to say that the Harrisburg, the white community of Harrisburg was totally oblivious. To the needs of the um, of the black community or just generally the lower class of Harrisburg, um, so the the city beautiful movement is something that has to do with that was kind of the part of the point of um, extending the capital to make the city more beautiful um, and it became like really this prestigious place to live and so you had really um, really well to do residents including the governor congressmen lawyers judges people with um, like political power. And so uh, they were the elite of Harrisburg, and so they, but they really paid attention to the community because they knew that the, the, their wealth depended on their city's well-being. Um, they wanted to keep the status quo there. They didn't want anyone to be really upset, or they didn't want to be a lot of polarization because that would ultimately um, undo some of their, some of their, uh, their wealth or their economic benefit. So they invested in the city, and they ended up. Um, creating things like the Bethesda Mission, which is still in Harrisburg, and other kind of like public service things like orphanages and stuff like that. Um, so right, the, there, there was it was segregated for sure, but they still kind of had a mutual dependence on each other, the black and the white community. Um, so this began a change um, with the Great Migration. So this is when African Americans um, migrated in masses to the northern cities because they were fleeing. Um, Jim Crow laws and they wanted economic opportunity and stuff like that. And so that really affected Harrisburg. Um, it was projected that Harrisburg would turn into this new Richmond um, and during its golden age it was really prosperous and they thought it's, the population was going to reach 125,000 um, and it was going to become a, a very, a very um, metro metropolitan city. Um, but that never happened because um, the mass migration and great migration was met with white flight. Um, so basically, I have this um, this formula, and I don't think I have the time or the capacity to explain it to you, but basically an economic scholar um, used census data and everything like that, and this is just national average, it's not specific to Harrisburg, but on, on the average, every, um, every migration to a city, so every one arrival in a northern city, was resulted in 2.7 departures. So this left cities um, underpopulated, um, property values fell, uh, and things like that. So definitely happened in Harrisburg, as we can see here. Um, the population from 1920, so the golden age, to 1950, 10 years after the Great Migration began, um, it did increase, um, but 36, it had 36% of the two counties at that time, but at the end it only had 31%. So everyone else was increasing more than they were, and they were losing their political power. And so then by 1960, um, the African American population tripled and lost 90% of its leadership. And there was a lack of civic awareness, like we talked about before, um, ambition and industry. Um, but I, in this way, Harrisburg's loss was kind of like the suburb's gain. Um, so I'm using Camp Hill as an example of a West Shore suburb. So in, during this time, it, it annexed 180 acres there was a 191% increase in population, so it almost tripled, and 1,576 homes were built. 
during just in those 25 years. So that's a very rapid expansion. And so the mayor of Philadelphia during this time described this as the white news of suburbia around sur suburban cities. Um, so basically, the suburbs were just sucking all of the life and um, all of the, the civic engagement out of these big cities like Harrisburg. Um, and so what the mayor of Harrisburg had to say about it is he said, the, demogra the demographics of the situation, so white flight, clearly show that the outward movement concentrates on the well-to-do, younger, more productive segments of the population, leaving to the cities a high proportion of the old, the poor, and the minorities who cannot afford or are not allowed to similar freedom or movement. Um, so, yeah, I think, obviously, um, at this time, it was the American dream to live in a suburb, raise a family there, and not just white people wanted that. So economic, um, like the economic inability um, was a factor, but are not allowed to. What, is, what could that mean? Um, so, basically, African Americans weren't allowed to move to a lot of suburbs because um, they were sundown towns. And so what a sundown town basically is, is just a town that didn't allow African Americans within its limits after um, nightfall. So um, that obviously barred them from living in these suburbs. And so based on oral history, the West Shore was likely home to two of these sundowns, which are Camp Hill and Mechanicsburg. And so the methods that the, the towns used to keep out the African American population very, um, it started off with ordinances, which were actual laws that um, the, the local town would pass, saying that African Americans aren't allowed to live here. Uh, but they were, uh, the Supreme Court deemed them unconstitutional in 1917, um, and so they weren't allowed to be used. But taking the place of that came racially restrictive covenants. Um, so the Supreme Court upheld those because the state wasn't doing the action, so it was just a private agreement between, um, between residents so they were okay, and basically we have an example here, and just as if you, you know, had a restriction as to what animals you could have on your property, you are forbidden from selling your property to people who aren't white. Um, so these were, um, these were eventually in 1968 uh, upheld as unconstitutional, but uh, sociolog sociologist Douglas Massey, um, he argues that these practices just went underground. They didn't really go away. So even though sundown towns technically ended in 1968 with the Fair Housing Act, um, they're still alive and they continue through deceptive practices by realtors, um, things like lying, giving them the wrong address, or steering them away from certain neighborhoods. So these are the oral, some oral history that it, or why we can say that Mechanicsburg and Camp Hill were probably um, sundown towns. So the one is, um, my family moved there because they knew that there was work for white women in that town. This is because there, were a, there was a law that no colored people could be on the street after sundown. Often I heard it said that if a colored person was seen by, this, by the police after dark, they would be picked up if not arrested. Okay, so that was probably an ordinance. And then another one, a fellow realtor told me not to show blacks properties in Camp Hill because the realty agency didn't want to be the first to sell a house to a black in that town. And this, was, this happened in the 1980s, so well after um, the Fair House Housing Act and everything made these things illegal, um, but it was, it was still continuing. So that was an example of the underground practice. Okay. Um, and this is for Mechanicsburg and the West Shore in general. My brother-in-law bought a house in Mechanicsburg five years ago, and in signing all the paperwork, there was a racially restricted housing covenant attached. There was a single pen mark slash through that particular piece of paperwork. So that would be something that we saw before on the screen. Um, and then the realtor told me, and this was two weeks ago, I could live on the West Shore, but it's really called the White Shore, so I'd probably be happier somewhere else. And that's an example of steering. Um, realtors telling African Americans that, you know, you probably don't want to live there. And it's illegal, but it happens all the time, and it's pretty effective because most people don't want to live somewhere they're not wanted. And so a good sign that you're not wanted in a community is that there's no one of your race there. Um, and so all this, this, um, the well-to-do people kind of siphoning off into the suburbs and the loss of political power, they weren't able to maintain that status quo anymore. Um, this contributed to the race riots in 1969. Um, and what these race riots did was they really confirmed the myth that the Federal Housing Administration um, was marketing that neighborhoods need to be racial, racially homogenous to be stable and for you to um, uphold your property value. And 
so yeah, people, the, the way people obviously um, responded to this uh, and the fact that there was violence going on by leaving the city as an answer, seeking refuge in the suburbs. Um, and so, and also because the black community was so accommodationist throughout its history, Harrisburg didn't really have a, a mechanism to make social change or respond to this, this racial tension in any productive way. Um, so racial separatism became the answer. Like that's the way we could solve the tension by just going our separate ways. Um, and so and during this period, Harrisburg lost more residents than ever before to white flight. Um, so 14,797 residents in the next decade. Um, so that led to a rapid, rapid change in racial composition. So those are all of the main things that contributed to this racial separation we have today. So was it a success? Um, do we still have this racial tension? Uh, I did some interviews in my research with people who live on the West Shore and the East Shore. So these are the most um, memorable um, bits I got from them. So let's see how that's going. Um, so if you have a black guy walking in Camp Hill, he's noticed. And if you have a white guy and a black guy walking down the street in Camp Hill, that's even worse yet. Uh, it's the whiteness of Camp Hill that makes it more progressed. And the tension is there. You could cut it with a knife. That last part is res in response to um, sporting events that have between you know white shore communities, so west shore communities, and east shore communities. Um, there's tension there, and it is manifested in different ways. And so it definitely hasn't gone away. Um, and uh, obviously, I mean, this one that's not definitely not an ideal um, race relational re relationship. Um, and so then an East Shore perspective, um, so this is a Harrisburg resident, um, so this is about an experience working on the West Shore. He told me that I didn't have the proper image to be working there. Um, some don't come over to the East Shore because they're afraid, and some don't come over to the, East, the West Shore because they're afraid. Um, they just have so much more, like what a difference 15 minutes can make. If you had enough of those people staying back, there would be more opportunity for change. So um, all these statements really just illustrate the um, the tension that is still present and how it manifests itself in different ways. Um, so like discrimination in the workplace um, and just this idea of an us versus them mentality. Like being having a mutual fear of your neighbors 15 minutes away isn't, isn't healthy and doesn't make for a good community. It, it, it perpetuates the tension and it perpetuates the segregation because if you're afraid to go across the river, how are things ever going to become more integrated? Um, so, moving forward, I think that it's important for us to think about what could be done to kind of, we can't go back in time and correct these things that happened on all the opportunities we missed to um, have a more integrated community. But I think the legal system might have a role that it can play in it. Um, I'm very passionate about this issue, um, and so I think that um, Something should be done in the, in the suburbs that were sundown towns. They did practice open discrimination against um, African Americans, and so if it's um, if it's a matter of you know telling them they have to be more open about their history or they have to be more apologetic about their history, um, I think something like that can make a difference. Um, what could we do as communities? Uh, I think that's a question we should ask ourselves too, um, and how our vision of our community, what that should be, um, thinking about if it's um, this, if it's elite, if it's um, think about the good qualities of our neighborhood, and maybe rethink those. <clears throat> and then, what can I do on a personal and on an individual level? Uh, I think this might be the easiest thing we could do is just go across the river. Uh, I think that. There, there is validity in our fears of going across um, whether whatever side we're on. Um, I can understand the apprehensions there, but I think making an effort, especially on, on the West Shore, um, going into Harrisburg and, and interacting with people, interacting, um, interacting with the community, uh, I think, that, I think that, that can make a bigger difference than we realize. Um, and so those are just some things that 
maybe we could do. Um, I definitely think the legal system and policies can play a huge part of it, and that's something that I'm interested in um, as I'm going to law school. So, yeah, that's the note I would like to leave you on. Thank you so much, Lydia, um, for telling us the story about Harrisburg campaign on the Shore and the West Shore. Um, I think one thing that is so important about what Lydia has done for us is really thinking about the many layers to the history of a place. Um, I really appreciate that you went all the way back to the 1780s and then build this narrative that is both thinking about um, sort of forced segregation and those um, active decisions that are made that perpetuate segregation and, and racism, but also some of the more subtle things that um, put into this larger narrative take on um, a significant meaning. Um, I think the real value of your work is that you are looking at such a particular community and recovering the really localized history um, of that community. Um, so thank you very much for your, for your work there. Um, the questions that I have for you, uh, and I have, I have a couple, I'll try to, uh, I'm gonna give you three, okay. okay? But these are kind of big questions and you can focus on one, start with one, and then we definitely wanna hear what, what others are thinking as well. Um, but the first question sort of comes to the relationship between this very localized story that you're telling and larger um, narratives across the country that um, in some ways are versions of the same story, but every place has its, its local context, right? Um, so I wonder what you would offer in terms of thinking about how your work in Harrisburg is connected to larger discussions. Um, surrounding the recovery of history and also the way we move forward um, in terms of, of segregation. So that's one, the okay. connection between the local and, and the national, maybe. Um, the second is that I was, I was struck by, particularly when you were bringing in the voices from the um, oral history, right? Um, and even the voices that were speaking from the, um, the West Shore perspective Several of them, you, you clarified or described them as uh, Harrisburg natives, or you know, having some sort of connection to Harrisburg. And what I was thinking was that people um, with recent, with, with uh, ties to Harrisburg in their lifetime um, have a sense of this history in a way that maybe people who are disconnected from Harrisburg genera generationally don't have that same memory. Um, so I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about, you know, who who remembers why certain people remember who has kind of the luxury to forget certain histories. Um, and the last question is uh, one you can dismiss and throw away if you want. But as a, uh, an English professor, I want to talk about your word choices, right, in your language, uh, and particularly the title that you started off with, A Perfect Barrier, which of course, you know, the river, but I'm wondering if there's more to be said about, particularly the adjective perfect, um, why you chose that, that word in particular. Okay. So choose, pick, start, and then okay. we'll, we'll continue the conversation. Sure, uh, so responding to the first question, um, yeah, this is definitely a national problem national issue um, and I mean if it's happened if it's happening right here it is happening in many other suburbs many other cities um, so I think that it is really important because a lot of this history is hidden um, towns really aren't so forthcoming about the discriminatory practices that mm -hmm. they've done in the past um, and so I think when you hear about it from on one level so in one city that prompts other other city other other cities other places to kind of think, oh, could this be happening like right where I live? Um, and I think that there's definitely a value in it being more of a not a universal, but more of a universal measure within the country. Um, so yeah. And your next question, 
was sorry, remind me. That's fine. No, the who who is remembering already? Oh, right, right, right. Who, who gets to yeah. yeah. Is it a clear mm -hmm. east west divide in that? Sense? Right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I was really fortunate in that I actually interviewed someone who had grown up in Harrisburg, uh, and he had uh, experienced the race riot, uh, riots, and everything like that, and that definitely uh, prompted him to leave the city into the suburb. But he had a de he definitely had a lot to say about that topic. Um, <coughs> he was very much of the mind that if you're li chances are if you live if you live in Camp Hill, if you're brought up there, you usually stay there. That's what's like happening a lot. Um, and so you're kind of just oblivious of like the other side of the river of that barrier is what he was he, is what he was saying. Um, and so I think I think definitely I think um, it kind of puts a burden on us to know to be aware of the history, right? And so it's easy to it's easy to not be aware of it, and it's it's kind of convenient to to not be aware of it, um, to kind of just be content and and not thinking about these problems that happened years ago in the place where you're living um, because once you know about it, it's, it gets, it could, and you don't know what to do about it, it could get kind of frustrating. Um, so I think that, but then other people, other people don't have luxury of forgetting. Um, they have been affected by this, they're not able to leave the, um, from the place where the race riot was happening uh, or something like that. So. I think that I think that education is really important, um, and so if you live on the West Shore and you don't know that these things, that's okay. Um, they're not right there in the out in the open for everyone to know. But I think that um, if we if we spread some of this history and we kind of spread awareness of it, then it can change things. And I think that education can change a lot of things. Um, and so yeah, I think that we could empower um, communities by becoming more in touch with their history. Um, and as far as the language, right, um, so I was actually interviewing somebody when they said this term is the perfect barrier. Um, and it was ironic, it said perfect, but not in a good way. Um, <laughs> so I guess for some, some sense it's, it's perfect. It's perfect for um, the, the realtors who wanted to have racially homogenous communities. Um, it's perfect for uh, people who discriminated against African Americans, um, but I don't think it's ever been perfect for people living in the city. And I don't think it's, it's perfect for people who value diversity and where they live. Um, there's definitely an, uh, there's definitely a value to living in a place that is not racially homogenous. Um, and that's something that you can't really um, like fake. And so the people living in the city definitely have a disservice going to them for a lot of different different ways, education system and stuff like that. Um, but people um, living outside the city are definitely at a disadvantage for other in other ways too. Um, so it's very it's very like, ironic the perfect barrier um, in what way is it perfect? Probably not the good way. Yeah, thank you. Very, uh, and I'm sorry I was late, but very nice, you know, last 15 minutes I heard. So, um, let me be autobiographical if I can, because it affects my uh, questions. Um, I live in Camp Hill, um, and my uh, title on my house has one of these riders on it that is crossed out. And I would say you find them in most of the houses in Camp Hill still, uh, most of the people paid the thousands of dollars to have them totally removed uh, from the title process. Um, uh, so that, that's just a confirmation that these things are there. Um, but on mine, it, it explicitly said, you will not sell your home to blacks and Jews. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I raise that as an issue because I'm intrigued by the degree to which you, this might extend beyond the African American community and thinking about that ethnic slash religious form of discrimination and it's, and it's a particular manifestation in, in Camp Hill because there was that history in Camp Hill as well as a Protestant place uh, in which Jews were explicitly kept out. Um, and, and what were those the same things? Were those different things? Did they happen at the same time? Did they happen at different times? I don't know if you know that. that that's one of my questions. Uh, the second thing would be kind of less of a historical, maybe more of a, a sociological question, but uh, 
I became very self-conscious of being used, partly because you see that in your release, right? But um, also because it's my area. Uh, and we made really tough decisions coming in. The first thing I looked at was uh, which schools had the highest numbers of students going to college. I thought, to be honest, I kind of naively wasn't thinking about the racial issue. Well, can't go in the first year number one. You know, I have, I have to say that's just that was just the case at that time. I don't know if it's still the case. It's still the case. Uh, and that was a, that was a very much a driving factor for me as an educator, as a parent, and, and so forth and so on. Uh, and I would even say that as we've had more African American families in the end, slowly, uh, that is driving back the quality of schools. Uh, the reason I raise that is because I think it would be interesting to to apply to this about the racial makeup now, um, and, and what is driving it now as opposed to what drove it historically, because it is still a very segregated community. I you know that you know, cut the root tension like a knife. It is very very true. You can't build it in the present. Bernardo uh, at a different time driving through Camp Hill. Um, uh, so I think it would be interesting, if they're driven by different things now to the same effect, uh, I think, uh, in, in some respects by people that move into the community. Uh, you know, they don't have the historical context that made those things happen, but the community still ends up being very, very segregated. Mm -hmm. So. Um, uh, that's kind of a comment, uh, that maybe is kind of a question. Hey, did you look at any of those things, both the Jewish and black communities, but also like, what about now and how right. to continue to self-segregate is, is a yeah. question. Yeah, uh, I think that kind of the, um, the underground discrimination is something that pertains here. Um, if you look in, so um, if I could go back to my first slide and go back to the map. Um, so it's interesting because if you look in uh, Lemoyne, so that is like, it's really, really white, so there's not a lot of African Americans there. And then you look at like progress, it's definitely darker there. Um, and the median income in progress is higher than Lemoyne. So it's not just an economic factor still. Um, it definitely is because there are so many people who live in the city that want to move to the suburbs just for education, you know, um, as the main factor. Um, but there's still, um, there's still something more than economic there, right? Whether it's something like what I talked about before of, um, you know, not feeling wanted in that area, or it's something like the, you know, the apprehension to go on the West Shore, East Shore, the tension there. Um, there's something like more than economic, so that's really interesting. Um, and then the S to the Jewish, um, I think that, I don't know if you were here when I was talking about the othering, um, but I was talking about the Irish and the German immigrants um, and how they were able to assimilate into white culture um, after you know, cultural distinctions kind of faded away after a couple of generations, um, but blacks never had that opportunity because of the color of their skin. And so just because of othering, physical distinctions, we mark people, us versus them, based on physical distinctions, um, that's something that makes African Americans different than other minorities, and that's why they're still in a different place while other minorities have advanced socially. Um, and so that is, that is, yeah, that's something to think about. Um, there's definitely, it's not just things aren't just black and white, um, but for the scope of this, of this research due to the history, I really just focus on African American and uh, white segregation, but no, others, other forms of uh, ethnic segregation are really important too. And, and it would just confirm that in the sense that there is a fairly robust Jewish community, community in our tiny place, <laughs> there is a very robust uh, Jewish community in Camp Hill. Now, um, it's still very segregated, white and black. Um, and so, but, but in the 1950s, there were still writers on, on titles that said, you cannot sell your home. And actually, in the 1950s, a lot, a lot of Jewish people moved to Edgemont. You see it right there. Mm -hmm. So it was, now is primarily African American, but in the 50s, I mean, it was mostly um, Jewish. So. In Edgemont? Yeah, or in Susquehanna? Maybe earlier than that. When, when did? I'm just was button, making sure I heard. We'll talk about it later. <laughs> is that not true? Uh, Edgemont was largely. In, in or is it Susquehanna? In the 50s. 
uh, Susquehanna Township probably had a cluster of Jewish people, but Edgemont itself was. Is that yes. Mm -hmm. Got it. <laughs> Susquehanna Township. <laughs> but now I would say Susquehanna Township is also primarily African. Would you say? Or I, I, I think so, but I'm not terribly sure about that. I can just speak to the history of that. I think this might be a good place to transition. I want to thank Lydia again.